Hi everyone. Today I'm going to take you through the case study of Renault Nissan. The case discusses the story of Nissan's miraculous turnaround after Renault decided to invest in the company. The automobile industry had just begun another wave of consolidation and many industry leaders believed that size was crucial for survival. This conclusion led to several mergers and acquisitions that produced varying results. The deal concluded between Renault and Nissan was remarkable because it was not built or designed as an acquisition or even joint venture. It was structured as an alliance, emphasizing the fact that both companies would have their own separate identities in the marketplace and separate executive committee that would run their strategy. However, the benefits were expected to originate in cross-company synergies ranging from design to manufacturing and logistics to R&D. This case also offers a rich description of the critical competitive elements that characterized the industry at the time the deal was signed. It also provides a good background on the strengths and weaknesses associated with each of the two companies before getting into the details associated with creating the turnaround plan and its implementation. Now, before moving to this case study, I would request everyone to subscribe 5 Minutes Learning Channel in YouTube in order to get my recent case studies updates on time. Also, this video is enabled with English subtitles for your better understanding. Now, let's move to the case study. Renault had been a quite a profitable company, with profits jumping a massive 63% in the year 1999. Renault's product line had limited appeal outside the immediate Western European market. Its early foray into the US marketplace was met with stiff customer resistance. Finding the cars quite small, underpowered, and poorly appointed, American buyers had not embraced the brand. The bland styling and poor quality of the product proved that the leading to Renault's exit from the US in the year 1986. By 1999, the company seemed to be poised to seize the next major opportunity. The first such opportunity emerged when Renault bid for the Swedish car maker Volvo, a deal that would have consolidated its position in Europe. The deal, however, failed to materialize. Cultural incompatibilities were one of the many reasons that were blamed for the outcome. In an increasingly globalized industry with the global consolidation race well underway, Renault's future remained uncertain. Nissan, on the other hand, had been teetering on the brink of collapse. It had been losing market share globally for eight years in a row and had seen home-based rivals chipping away at its market position in Japan. It had lost market share in its home market for 26 years straight with no end in sight. Over the years, the benevolent banking system in Japan had given Nissan a wide berth by extending significant loans that helped it tide over its misfortunes. In the face of widespread economic stagnation in the country, even the friendly banks, however, decided to call in the loans and pressured the company to find a partner willing to bail it out. The automotive debt burden for Nissan had risen to about $20 billion by that time, while overall debt exceeded $38 billion, four times the company's market capitalization. The reason for the dramatic failure were many fold. Nissan was viewed as a bureaucratic company run much like a state-owned enterprise, complete with multiple layers of decision-making, lax control, and a weak performance culture. It had fairly complex supply chains encompassing more than 3,000 suppliers supporting 25 different platforms. 
only four of its 43 models were profitable and it had an excess capacity of roughly 50 percent a production network it had built in the heyday of the luxury business when the company had attempted to double its sale to 1.5 million units in a short time the projected demand never materialized and the company had nothing to show for its investments but an annual interest bill that totaled $1 billion in the year 1998. Renault and Nissan were both jilted partners in the automotive world of the mid-90s. Although they each had their own unique desires for the pursuit of partnerships, they had been unable to attract any viable suitors. Renault and Nissan initiated talks in July 1998 and began to seriously explore the potential for a deal over the next six to eight months. This period of due diligence was characterized by intense cooperation between the two companies and involved a fairly large group of top leaders as well as middle managers. Schwitzer sought counsel from his trusted advisor, Carlos Gorn, who was not directly involved in the process of negotiations or due diligence. Gorn advised Schwitzer to drop the joint venture approach and pursue an alliance instead. This proved to be a critical rallying point during the process and helped the teams overcome the legal wrangling and smooth out their differences. In March 1999, Switzer and Hanawa signed an alliance agreement allowing Renault to buy 36.8% of Nissan for $5.4 billion. Renault was also given the right to increase its holding to 44.4% from May 2001 if it is so desired. Nissan took a 10% stake in Renault. The deal was promoted as an alliance. The main distinction was that both firms would keep their identity separate and would be run by separate management teams. However, they would leverage common synergies through custom-built process spanning a range of functions from design to engineering and product development to distribution. Having signed the alliance agreement, Louis Schwitzer called on Carlos Gorn to head to Japan to oversee the Nissan's turnaround. Although Gorn himself rated the probability of his success at 50%, but still Schwitzer had much greater confidence in his abilities and was convinced that he had a very good shot at achieving success. Despite the professional excitement around the assignment, Gorn had to tackle some organizational issues before deciding to go to Japan. He realized that the job would require a great deal of latitude from Renault headquarters and he would not have the time to wait for an approval on critical decisions. So he discussed his reservation with the company and obtained top leadership approval to make decision locally in Japan without reverting to Paris. He also reserved the right to pick his own team. He assembled a small group of executives that included many Renault veterans and other potential high flyers. Only one member in the team spoke Japanese and none had worked in Japan before. Gon was more concerned about the innate abilities of his team to make dramatic changes and act as catalyst of change in a fairly staid and stodgy environment. Prior to his departure for Tokyo, the group met for a three-day briefing on do's and don'ts, but more importantly, to focus on the key messages that Gon wanted them to fully embrace. He wanted them to focus on fixing Nissans exclusively without getting mirrored in social debate about prevailing business custom and a practice in the country. He was officially appointed as COO of Nissan in June 1999, with Hanawa continuing in the role of president of the company.
taking a page from his previous management experience at Michelin and Renault, Gon created a structure around cross-company teams and cross-functional teams, CCT and CFTs. The 11 CCTs were organized around synergy areas such as purchasing, manufacturing, product platforms and technology, staffed by 10 members each, almost exclusively from middle management ranks. The CCTs were the key drivers for generating the revival plan for the company. Appointments to the CCTs were made solely on the basis of merit. Smaller teams that lent specialized expertise in focus areas such as capacity planning and investments supported the CCTs. The work of the CCTs was complemented by the CFTs within each of the companies. Gone used the team selection process as a vehicle to convey the gravity of the situation as well as his intent to rely on middle management expertise. To this end, he asked 1,500 profile of leading Nissan candidates for these assignments, both from Japanese as well as international operations, be posted at headquarters so that choices could be made on the basis of merit. English was chosen as the common language of communication for all official exchanges under the Alliance. English language courses were offered to both Nissan and Renault employees, while Gon himself was taking Japanese conversation courses. In a break with tradition, Gon insisted that the press be invited to the first annual meeting. The Nissan revival plan was ready for the launch in October 1999, three months after the new governance structure had been implemented. On the eve of the annual Tokyo Motor Show, Gon presented the restructuring plan to a wide audience of journalists and car enthusiasts worldwide. He summarized his objective in three areas. One, a return to profitable operations by the year 2000. Two, operating margin of at least 4.5% by 2002. And three, decrease Nissan's outstanding debt to $6.3 billion by 2002. In his closing remarks, Gon acknowledged that if the revival plan succeeded, it would have many fathers, but if it is failed, it would have only one himself. Management of talent and human resources was an integral part of the change effort. Gon saw that his plans would only be successful if he could replace key elements of the administrative heritage of Nissan, and that obviously called for radical change in managing people. There were three key dimensions that warranted further examinations, namely the senior system of career growth and advancement, two, a culture of blame, and three, lack of clear motivation and rewards. Within the purchasing organization, there was a new structure in place with a general manager overseeing each of the major input areas, namely power trains, vehicle parts, and materials and services. Under each of the general managers, there were global supplier account managers who negotiated with large suppliers worldwide. Deputy General Supply Account Managers assisted the General Supply Account Managers. When the General Supply Account Managers was a Renault employee, the Deputy General Supply Account Managers was a Nissan employee and vice versa. This mirror effect helped immensely since the decision makers were taking, talking to counterparts who shared similar concerns and perspectives on the other side. They spoke the same language of the functions that is purchasing. Global structures were established for managing finance, manufacturing, IT, and R&D functions. Similar changes were introduced to seek synergies in range of areas spanning product design and manufacturing to managing dealerships as shown in the picture here.
In the year May 2001, when the first full year results after the transformation begin were announced, there was reason for at least cautious celebrations. Sales had already grown by 1.9% to nearly $50 billion and debt had shrunk nearly 50%. Operating margins had tripled to 4.75%. In many ways, Gon had not only fulfilled some of the key promises that he made when unveiling the revival plan, but in fact delivered the promises in a much shorter time frame than that was expected. For the first time in 26 years, Nissan seemed to have found the right road to prosperity. At the Tokyo Auto Show later that year, the first half results for 2001 were revealed to be more promising. Nissan's operating margin had reached 6.8% and 18 of its 38 models were now profitable. Gone's colleagues and industry analysts waxed poetic at this miraculous turnaround. Gone says, no matter how promising your resources, you will never be able to turn them into gold unless you get the corporate culture right. A good corporate culture taps into the productive aspects of a country's culture. And in Nissan's case, we have been able to exploit the uniquely Japanese combination of keen competitiveness and sense of community that has driven the likes of Sony and Toyota and Nissan itself in early times. People have to believe that they can speak the truth and that they can trust what they hear from others. Thank you everyone for watching this video. See you soon with another interesting video of case study. For more such case studies, please visit 5 Minutes Learning Channel in YouTube.